Welcome everyone to the Genetics Podcast, where we explore some of the latest breakthroughs in genetics and genomics and biotech as a whole. In this episode, I'm really excited to speak with Warren Huff, the CEO of Riata Pharmaceuticals, a company based out of Dallas, Texas, that develops therapies for serious life-threatening diseases that in many cases have no treatment whatsoever. And the company has been going for just a little over 20 years now and has had amazing success recently in a rare disease called Friedrich's ataxia that we're going to spend some time today going into the story of. But before we get to that, Warren, I first of all just want to say thank you for taking the time to join me. And you've been leading Riata for nearly 20 years now, or maybe over 20 years. How did you get your start uh, with Riata and in biotech as a whole? Well, first of all, Patrick, thanks so much for, uh, for having me on. Well, I founded the company is the short answer and then did an extensive search for who should be the CEO. And it turned out it was me. (laughs) And you were Um, a lawyer, right? Was it prior to most people don't, I I suspect people don't realize that because you have such an in-depth knowledge of biotech and chemistry, but you, were you a lawyer before? I was a lawyer. Yeah. I was a corporate securities lawyer for many years and I had a number of biopharmaceutical clients, you know, when you're a corporate lawyer, like, you know, most of your work is in, you know, mergers and acquisitions and financings. And, but I was just, I would spend an inordinate amount of time with my small biotech clients because I was, I was so fascinated by what they did. And it was really my first exposure really to real drug development. And I just knew I wanted to do it. And so I ended up joining a small startup biotech in Boston. I literally left my law partnership and moved my family to Boston and joined this this small startup biotech out of Harvard. And that's how I got my start. And it was was one of the dumbest things I've ever done, actually. <laughs> what, what was that company? What was the company and what were you was, doing there? It was named Ergo Science and it it had a diabetes drug that was based on essentially modulating prolactin using bromo, a flash dose of bromocryptine that was given on a timed daily basis. And it was quite effective. We saw, you know, reductions in A1C of over a point, you know, in the pivotal studies, you know, in, in refractory advanced, you know, type 2 diabetics. And then founding Riata, whoa, oh. what, I, one of the things that oh. I know you all do a lot of today is you do a lot of work with universities that have you know, breakthrough science or, or maybe sometimes diamonds in the rough where you think it could be a breakthrough with a little more work and then you help to take it to the next level. Is that the idea when you started or has that evolved over time? It absolutely is. I, I moved back to, to Texas for family reasons and I got recruited to work with UT Southwestern and with MD Anderson. And most, many people don't know, UT Southwestern is a powerhouse institution for Nobel Prize winners in life science. When I was there, you know, HMG CoA reductase, you know, with Brown and Goldstein basically identified there. And there was a lot of frustration there and in the state. They're both the University of Texas subunits that they, they do this great science work. And then the inventions get licensed out mainly to California where there's venture capital and the companies get founded there. So they had an initiative to try to develop the biotechnology industry in the state. And I was one of the few people that had run a public biotech company. So I worked with them and looked at a lot of the projects that they had and kind of formulated the strategy for Riata, which was exactly as you said, to in-license very promising science, you know, from top academic institutions, of course, starting with those two, and it had to be something that had what I call provocative biology, you know, really interesting empirical findings. In most cases, the target wasn't known or the mechanism wasn't fully worked out. And it was usually a chemist involved or, it's, you know, they moved, moved it and had molecules and were, you know, trying to work out what was really going on. And those were really in our sweet spot. And we and licensed a number of those knowing there'd be a high failure rate. A big thing we did was manage everything as a portfolio to manage the risk. And, and we could do that because we were, had the cooperation of the institutions. And so that's really how we got started. And maybe you could tell the story of your big recent success. I think it's been close to a 20-year journey, right? How did it start? And yeah. maybe you could talk us through the, the players along the way. Yeah. So the, the class was being developed jointly by MD Anderson and Dartmouth. And there's a renowned scientist, uh, Michael Sporn, 
who co-discovered TGF beta and is thought of, I think, by many as kind of the father of cancer prevention. And so the work was really, he had, he had been at the NCI, retired, went to Dartmouth Medical School, and he started this project to identify anti-inflammatory and tissue protective agents that could prevent carcinogenic transformation, which is kind of where he'd done his work, the tissue response to injury and how that leads to carcinogenic transformation. And Dr. Sporn thought like a great approach, could we get safe drugs that we could take chronically to basically block the transformation and have a big impact on cancer? And so he, he did this project you would never do in industry. So he identified scaffolds from the literature that had weak anti-inflammatory and tissue protective properties. And he, one of the scaffolds he was working with was oleanolic acid, which is used in Chinese herbal medicine. And he and a chemist at Dartmouth did this beautiful random walk medicinal chemistry campaign, making alterations to the structure and then looking at the effects in this brute force model of inflammatory activation. So they take raw macrophages, activate them with interferon gamma, and look at the effect on NO production in the assay of the compounds. This was proposed to him by Carl Nathan, another you know, very important uh, contributor in, in the in- inflammatory biology. And so they, they took, so the oleanolic acid is a triterpenoid, and on the A-ring, they added a Michael acceptor an electrophilic binding motif that almost no industrial medicinal chemist would do because they're thought of as prolific binders to, to, you know, you know, to, to sulfur. And so does it cause, does that cause toxicity problems or something? That was the thought. Of course, the biology is much more elegant that now it's known that there's a whole network of these cysteine residues and they're, they're a, a major redox regulatory mechanism on, you know, in key pathways. And so, but it, this was the reductionist human view was like, oh, no, we, that, that would never work. So he, he did it and they saw a 10,000 fold increase in potency in the assay. Wow. I mean, they were as potent as steroids through an unknown mechanism. It was a, a huge finding. And of course, they did the NCI 60 panel and a bunch of other things to characterize the molecules. They induced apoptosis, but were tissue protective. I had these really amazing properties. And he struck up many collaborations and with people largely involved in the, an interest in cancer prevention, you know, and the, through a cytoprotective response. And so he shared the, the compounds with Paul Talalay and Tom Kinsler at Johns Hopkins, two National Academy of Science members and experts in a transcription factor called NRF2. And I think they immediately suspected that these are potent NRF2 activators. And they showed that and, and published it in uh, PNAS that these were Dr. Sporn's triterpenoids were the most potent activators of NRF2 ever identified. You may be aware that a lot of people now take sulforaphane and take curcumin, you know, as very, as kind of weak NRF2 activators. Sulforaphane was, was very well understood at the time, but the triterpenoids that Sporn discovered are like, you know, as I said, about like 10,000 fold more potent. Wow. So we, we saw the data and in licensed them based on the provocative biology and our theory was that looking at, it, at all the data was that they're inhibiting nf kappa b And it became clear, we have a great molecular biologist, Debbie Ferguson, and she had this insight that looking at NRF2 and looking at the effects on nf kappa b that these were mimicking an anti-inflammatory prostaglandin called 15-deoxy prostaglandin J2. You can think of it as like a it's like the body's way of making a molecule that looks like lipid peroxidation, but isn't damaged. So it's a greasy prostaglandin with an electrophilic binding motif, and it activates NRF2 transcription. That, that all is really well worked out. So NRF2 is pre-made by the cells, and then it's, it's degraded until it's needed. And so it's, it's, it's regulator is a protein called keep one and it has like 17 exposed cysteine residues. It's like a sensor of redox stress and prostaglandin J2 in the resolution of a normal inflammatory response is made 
and binds to keep one and activates NRF2. All part of now we understand a coordinated way to wrap up the inflammatory response when it's not needed. Right. So they they discovered this 10,000 fold more powerful activator, but they at first didn't know the mechanism and through a series of collaborations were able to work it out. When you entered the picture, did you know it was an NRF2 that it was involved with NRF2 or or, or you actually entered the picture before that? Before. It was did, about a does year that make you, before. Did that make you nervous <laughs> getting in? Uh, when, you, when you approach these more generally, does it, d- do you worry about not knowing the mechanism or is that that's part of the game? That's the opportunity for us because, you know, Sporn had, you know, great reputation and collaborations with all the big pharma and the data was all amazing, but yeah. he didn't know the target. And so, you know, in most drug development organizations, if you don't know the target, well, you know, this is all interesting, but, you know, come back when you understand the biology better. And so that was actually the opportunity for us. And we were, we were interested in rolling up our sleeves and working and, and working on the mechanism, you know, with our academic collaborators. As I said, our theory was that it was inhibiting NF-kappa B based on all the data. And it turns out it was because NRF2 and NF-kappa B are like yin and yang. So they recruit the same cofactors. There's multiple mechanisms through which when NF-kappa B is up, NRF2 is suppressed. When NRF2 is up, NF-kappa B is suppressed. In fact, you know, NRF2 directly binds to and suppresses the the production of many of the nf kappa b target genes and and those who are who know the disease well I, that i mentioned at the beginning friedrich's ataxia they they may be struggling to put these two together nrf2 you spoke about cancer you spoke about the immune system how did you draw the link then between and and nrf2 is a is a is a target that's being pursued in a broad range of diseases right now and i, I think yes. you all explored and are exploring quite a broad range maybe you can talk about the vast disease space, and then also how you honed in on, on Friedrich Detaxia as the first major success. Sure. In the early development, you know, we were, we were focused on actually the applications in cancer for the suppression of NF-kappa B and the restoring normal, you know, apoptotic response. And so the first member of the class, Bardoxalone, was, it did its, its phase one in an all-solid tumor you know, study. We did at MD Anderson. It had quite good results. And so we, early on, we were looking in the cancer space. We had a practical problem though. This was 2008, 9, 10, and Big Pharma had become very interested in uh, the oncology space. And there was a huge number of tyrosine kinase inhibitors in development. And we literally couldn't produce data. We couldn't get our studies enrolled. And so we, we looked at alternative indications and the first thing we did was actually chronic kidney disease because we noticed these very provocative improvements in kidney function in the cancer patients. And so we went down that path, you know, for a while and along the way produced a second molecule, OMAP, the now approved molecule, which has very, gets a very good penetration through the blood brain barrier. And we were approached by FARA, the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance, and a, a, key opinion, a couple of key opinion leaders there about using our molecules for FA. They had done an incredible amount of work validating NRF2 as a target. So the patient group, you know, recruited top labs and was funding basic research. Wow. And actually, to give a little background, so FA is a genetic mitochondrial disease. And so it's, there's a mutation um, in a, a protein called frataxin. It's, it's repeats. So you get this, this J repeats inserted as a result of the mutations. And you, you basically have inactive or compromised frataxin. And frataxin is an iron chaperone. And so it plays a critical role in shuttling iron to assemble the iron sulfur clusters in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. And so kids with FA basically have kind of impaired mitochondrial function as a result of that. It's a terrible disease. You're completely normal 
except you're kind of the clumsy kid on the playground. And, you know, about by the age 10 or 12, for most patients, it progresses to the point where it's what's clear there's some, some neurological you know, defect here and, uh, they go through a journey and now they, you know, they get diagnosed, you know, with FA and there's just no therapy. It's, you know, it's systemic neuromuscular disease. You gradually lose all neuromuscular function over about a 15 year period. And they, you know, their mortality is generally in their, their mid thirties. And there's been, it's been a wasteland of development. Many things have been tried, but in any event, the patient group had done an enormous amount of work. They sponsored this basic research and they had identified that NRF2 was suppressed in FA, you would expect it to be activated because you have basically free iron floating around your mitochondria, right? And so, you know, through the Fenton reaction, you're basically producing a lot of reactive oxygen where it shouldn't be in the mitochondria as as part of the phenotype. And you would think that would activate that redox imbalance would activate, but it's, it's suppressed. And then they had established that, you know, if you could restore it, Basically, you could, you know, improve mitochondrial function in the patients. So they, they came to us, you know, with that as a theory, because really we had these very active interrupt two activators. And one of the things that caught my eye that that caused us to get in touch with you in the first place is that this your your FDA approval pretty uniquely leaned heavily on some really strong natural history data that that also came from some of the foresight of the the FARA group, right? Maybe you could talk a little bit more about. For those who don't know what a natural history study is and and how that came about. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It was critical to to our approval. Well, literally 15 years ago around a kitchen table as they were forming this patient organization and getting advice, they were told that like for a disease like this, it'll be really helpful to understand the natural course of the disease and to develop ways to measure that. And so they started with just a handful of patients, but it grew fairly rapidly. And they, they basically conducted a formal natural history study. And basically it's, it's a full blown, you know, clinical study, with protocols, investigators, publications, everything, except there's no therapeutic intervention. The patients come in annually and they get a full workup. They get their measures of efficacy and all their baseline, you know, measures and everything. And they, the, the patients make this sacrifice. They, they come in annually and they participate in the study knowing there's no real, you know, therapeutic benefit, no potential with an experimental drug or anything. Uh, but it amasses a database of data on progression rates. You, you get very important data that allows you to predict the progression of patients because you have your baseline characteristics and, you know, things like repeat length. Now they know directly correlate to the rate of progression, you know, age of diagnosis does, you know, so you get this really rich data set. There's a valuable source of information, you know, about the disease related to this, they had to develop an endpoint. And so they developed what's called the Friedrich's ataxia rating scale. And this was by a handful of the key, you know, key and key opinion leaders, which of course were, were all neurologists familiar with these types of exams. And they designed one that was quite sensitive and targeted, you know, for FA. It's a lot like many of the other neurologic exams, you know, for other diseases, but it's very specific to FA. And then they took, you know, the really foresighted step of going to the FDA and showing them all this work, showing them the, 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 the FARS, the scoring, and got feedback from the FDA about what would be an approvable endpoint. Wow. And so there were some features of the initial, the FARS, that the FDA said, these are not really clinical measures. And so exclude them. <clears throat> and and they did and it's now called the m far modified fars and fda said this is we this would be an approvable endpoint for fa this is really critical because of the you need a measure that's sensitive very sensitive because it's very slowly progressive so it's terrible for clinical development i mean think about it you got a very small patient group only about five thousand patients in the u.s a few of which can actually participate in a study and you have this really slowly progressive disease and so you can't power a study, you know, for a small change. 
So you need an endpoint that's really sensitive to their neurologic change over a year or two. And that's what they, and they developed that and then started tracking it in this natural history study. And so what kind of things, I'm, I'm really just curious, what kind of things do you measure in that endpoint? What, what were the couple of <clears throat> insights that make it so sensitive compared to some other battery of tests that you could do? Yeah, there's four quadrants. It's upper limb coordination, bull bar swallowing, lower limb coordination, and then basically their ability to stand. And so there's a series of measures in each quadrant, and these are administered by the neurologist. But that helps a lot, you know, by, the, by a trained neurologist. And there are a lot of measures. They're taken repeatedly. It's a 100-point scale. And so it's just got excellent, you know, repeatability. It takes some time to do it. It's got to be in person. It's got to be done by a neurologist. You know, those things are limitations of it, but it's quite objective and quite sensitive. Do you think there's an opportunity in, in this disease and in others for, for clinical grade wearable devices and, and other sorts of things? Is that something that you all have, have thought about yeah. to measure even more continuously? And we've done some of that. I think it's definitely for the future. I think the the wearable devices are a great way, like these movement disorders, you know, should be, you know, really helpful there. So were you able to actually use the natural history study data to reduce your control arm or, or eliminate it entirely? Or, or how did that conversation go? Because like you said, it's a small patient population. But you've got really good data on on what happens in the absence of intervention. How did that negotiation go, and where did you end up with yeah. that? Right. So, so number one, you know the progression rate on average. I mean, which is huge, and it's about two points in the MFAR score, and so that per tells year. you right there two points a year yeah. about yeah on average, and so that's enormously valuable, right? I mean, if you didn't know that, how would you ever? take the risk on a study. So you make a reasonable assumption about your, your treatment benefit and your very, and by the way, you know, variability too, you've got really good variability data from that. And so you can use that, you know, to basically figure out your powering assumptions for the study. And so for the pivotal study, you know, for the, you know, we did, we did a, you know, gold-plated, randomized, placebo-controlled pivotal study, the largest one done in FA, it was a hundred patients. And so those, the knowledge of that progression rate was critical to its design, number one. And we hit it, you know, we, we hit it. Our, our assumptions held. We, we produced a 2.4 point MFARS difference, uh, placebo corrected difference over a year with a p-value of 0.014. And that was, it was interesting because what we observed and we repeatedly observed is the active treatment patients have an acute improvement in their MFAR score over the first four to 12 weeks of treatment. So they recover function and then they maintained it for the 48 weeks. The placebo patients, they have a clear placebo effect in this disease in multiple controlled studies. And so they get a placebo effect and then they start to lose it at about six months at the expected rate of progression. And so that produced this difference of 2.4 that was very significant. The natural history data was used by the FDA as, as essentially a kind of confirmatory study. Can you tell a little bit more about that? That's, that's very unique and I think a big, a big deal. It's a, it's a really important question because this, is, this has been an evolving area for the FDA and other, and other regulatory agencies. So in ra particularly in rare disease like this, you, know, you, you can't do... It's very difficult to do two pivotal studies, this, the, the standard. And so that's one standard. And if you can't meet that, how do you move it along? Well, the second standard is you do a single study, but the, it has to be statistically highly persuasive, which means a very deep p-value implying a very large n. And so this has been recognized by Congress and by the FDA. And some years ago, a thing called FADAMA 115 was put in place, which allowed for a single study approval plus confirmatory evidence. And there's been a lot of discussion about, well, what constitutes confirmatory evidence? And FDA has issued draft guidance on this. And there's several things that can, that can do it, like a very plausible mechanism of action perfect example would be like enzyme replacement therapy right. and a good understanding of the natural course of the disease is one of the ways that you can meet that standard. 
So in our interactions with the FDA, after the patients came off of the pivotal study, we rolled them over to a long-term open label extension and everybody went on active drug in it, but we never disclosed to the patients whether they were on active drug or placebo, you know, in the control portion of the study. And then we tracked them for their, we're out, many patients are out three and four years now. And so that data was accumulating as we were going through our NDA review, our NDA submission and review and everything. We're collecting this data in the open label extension. And we went to the division, the FDA, neurology division at FDA, and proposed as confirmatory evidence that we conduct a formal propensity matched analysis using the natural history data. And so basically what you do is for every patient in the open label extension, you look at their, their characteristics that predict progression, age of onset, repeat length, things like that. Now that you know from your natural history study what, and you match them basically to a patient in the database. And you do all this basically blinded, you, you set all this up and then you push a button and you compare the, oh. basically the progression rate of the patient in your open label extension to their matched patient from the natural history study. And there are a bunch of really good techniques for looking at how good the match is and you run it multiple times. And we did that and the data were, were quite good. It consistently showed with a, you know, highly significant p-values that the patients in the open label extension progressed at a rate slower than the patients in the natural history. So what would be expected based on the patients in the natural history study? And so that was actually freestanding. Basically, it was controlled and it was like an externally controlled study. It would meet all the ICH guidelines, except that we didn't pre-specify it. In the future, we'll right. pre-specify it. But FDA took that. I think they, they, they looked at that. And I think that was a key part of their decision to approve the drug because we had a well-controlled study that cleanly hit its endpoint. And then secondly, we had this very well done, you know, propensity matched analysis using a wonderful, you know, database that gave them confidence that this was a real treatment effect without a second study. It was all possible because of the work done you know, by the patients, by Farah and the key opinion leaders in generating the natural history database. So what, what, I think it would be fair. Would it be fair to say that a good, uh, more, more general lesson and takeaway for anyone focused on rare disease is to either partner with a patient organization that's already done the work to do this kind of study or, or collaborate with them to, to run one prospectively, right? So that you, you can be prepared for to Absolutely. play this card in the future. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And I think it's now clear, you know, FDA has gone through a series of approvals like in neuro, you know, that where they've fleshed out, they've worked out internally, like well, how they're going to apply these things. And there's, there's, there's guidance on the use of some of this now, but yes, anyone in the space that's conducting these studies, I should, I think, build in this into their design. They should roll patients over to an open label extension, do not disclose the original treatment assignments, um, and prospectively specify, you know, their, their analysis, their, their externally controlled propensity matched analysis, if the data is available. Yeah, that's excellent. I think that's such an important, uh, it's an important change. The FDA has, it seems like they're really innovating the they have such an important job of making sure that drugs are safe and that they work and i think in rare diseases in particular they've been really exploring how to ensure that drugs are still safe and that they work but but just think a little bit outside of the box especially in cases like this where um, it may not be possible to run two studies right and and uh, and the data is great yeah i totally agree they deserve a lot of credit actually for what happened with FA. They, they worked with the patient group on the endpoints. They provided the, these designs for the open label extension and these analyses. And so, yeah, I think they, 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 they've struck a good balance in, you know, being, having data that they can be confident about the approval decision on safety and efficacy, but at the same time, make it possible to develop drugs in these, in these rare diseases. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. At what, at what point were you intervening 
in the study, like what was the the minimum age cutoff, what was the maximum, and, and where I want to go with this is whether you, you mentioned it's a genetic disease, and there's a there's a growing movement towards greater newborn screening, and and I think that's a world we'll live in in a while. How how for, how far forward in life could we push something yeah. like this? Where are we now, and how far forward could we push it? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's it's one that we're really focused on now. So for the initial study. Frankly, because of our tox coverage and everything, we we went to 16 year olds and above, yeah. and that that was you know young enough to allow us to enroll the studies, but allowed us to move forward without a lengthy pediatric tox study. Right. We're now focused on lowering that that age limit. We're interacting with both the EMA and the FDA, you know, on approaches to doing that, and you know, I it's clearly you know, we need to push down to at least eight or 10 years old. We've been encouraged by the regulators to to go, you know, meaningfully lower. And so, and you're right, like this now, now that there's a therapy, like, you know, prenatal screening, all of those things are, you know, come into play. And so, so anyway, we're in a process of addressing that potentially through like an extrapolation approach or also, you know, or, you know, planning pediatric studies. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. And and at the same time, you're you're making a transition from a company that's really focused on early discovery and clinical development now to a company that is going to, I'm sure, continue to do a lot of that and a lot more. But also uh, moving into the moving into the healthcare system. What's that transition going to be like? It's it's a lot. <laughs> I mean, you know, you go, you know, in the development stage, you're you know, you're focused on your, you know your chemistry, your molecular biology, you know, your regulatory interactions, you know, you're running your clinical programs. But now you know, we have to make the drug. You know, we've got to haul that. We've, you know, got to have a you know, sales team and, you know, meta fairs. We've got to, you know, we want a really seamless experience for the patients. You know, we've you've got to educate all all the payers and you've, you've got to have your pharmacovigilance in place. You know, so it's a daunting task. And of course, we're, we're working on our, you know, our European approval process, you know, right, we're in the middle of that, you know, right now it was behind the US. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big transition, but one we're thrilled to do. I mean, it's, it's great to actually see a member of the class approved. I'm, I'm so happy about that, you know, that there's now an approved drug for the FA patients, but also we've got, you know, an approved, you know, NRF2 activator. Yeah, it's amazing. And and I think within the FA thread, it sounds like you're you're obviously working on getting this to as many patients, as many yeah. countries as you can, also moving earlier. Uh, is there can you apply this same molecule to other uh, to other diseases? How are you thinking about that? So the target, you know, NRF2 has become a really important, you know, target and a lot of work is being done uh, looking at the relationship between like, you know, NRF2 polymorphisms and, and disease. And, and, you know, there's a lot of places to go with this because, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, this really goes to kind of fundamentally the relationship between metabolism and inflammatory activation. They're not two processes. They're one process. And so a lot of great work is being done and kind of the short version is that you know, the role that mitochondria play in the inflammatory response is extremely important. So they receive, you know, your inflammatory stimulus signals from like the TLRs, et cetera. And, you know, we've all know that there's quote, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, right? A leakage of reactive oxygen. And it's been viewed as a defect, but it's a feature, right? So the mitochondria shift between, you know, in the non-inflammatory state, optimizing beta oxidation, producing ATP. But when there's a inflammatory threat, they shift into taking that oxygen and becoming reactive oxygen generators. And actually that along with reactive nitrogen diffuse through the space and activate other mitochondria basically to become reactive oxygen generators. And <clears throat> through a complex set of protein protein interactions but but well worked out downstream when you change that environment from reductive to more oxidative you get 
you get a assembly and activation of NF kappa B transcriptional activity. You get an assembly and activation of the inflammasome, and then all your your downstream downstream mediators. And so the NRF two we believe plays a role in wrapping all of that up when the inflammatory response isn't needed. And so it has like three major things. It converts mitochondria back to ATP production, which is, I'll come back to a really important feature. It's long been known it produces most of your antioxidant and detoxification enzymes. So it produces the glutathione synthesis enzymes. And so it, it mops up the battlefield, a way to think of it, and restores you back to a more reductive you know, environment. And then as I mentioned, NRF2 directly blocks, you know, the transcription of many NF-kappa B target genes. So you can see there's this coordinated response to restore everything back to homeostasis and it's suppressed. And so, you know, in diseases like Parkinson's disease, you know, or at Alzheimer's is a great example. I mean, type three diabetes, it's metabolic dysfunction of the brain with inflammatory markers, nrf 2s well-validated target, you know, for these. Most of these diseases, or, or many of them, manifest through impaired mitochondrial function. And so if you can restore that, you can produce, you know, a improvement in your neural function. And I think that's what we saw in FA. Like, we were able to restore, like, if you put OMAV on patient fibroblasts, it restored their mitochondrial function back to normal. And so we look at that as a marker for like where to go. And there's many places to go with, with the technology. You, you mentioned type three diabetes there, and I've, I've actually never, I've never heard of type three diabetes and I, I just Googled it in the background. Could you explain what that is? I, I imagine a lot of people, it's probably a new term to them. It's, it's the term that was used to kind of describe the metabolic deficits associated with Alzheimer's disease. Basically, right. it's you know, someone early on, I don't know who it was, but it was a great insight that this is basically type 3 diabetes of the brain. And so it's because of these, these metabolic deficits. And I believe that these are just related to the process I've just described. Like, it's fundamental to the inflammatory process. Amazing. I'm, I'm just finding the paper here. Uh, I'll see if we can find the original paper It'd and link it in. It'd be nice to know. Listening to you, you, you have, it sounds like three PhDs in biochemistry and, <laughs> and molecular biology. Did you, did you consider going into biochemistry or medicine before you went into law school or, or did this come later in life? How did you end up making that, that turn? I did. I, I loved science as a kid, read science and took all the science courses and everything that I could, really loved it. But I got basically terrible advice from my parents, which was, you know, don't do what you love, you know, <laughs> go do something you can make a living at. And I think like a lot of people that become lawyers, it's kind of like the, it's like the liberal arts, you know, master's degree. And so if you're, you know, good at a lot of things, you can kind of end up there. And, but then, you, you know, a lot of people hate it. And so, but anyway, I ended up down that path. And, and also, you know, where I grew up, like there was no pharma industry, you know, there was no, you know, obviously there was no biotech, but there was no pharma industry or anything. So I really never was exposed to it. As soon as I was exposed to it, I was like, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah. When, yeah. And having a, having a strong corporate law background sets you up really well to be a, a biotech CEO and leader, right? Because you really do need the science and, and know how to run a very complex business. Yeah. And you have to raise you know, ridiculous amounts of money. So it's good to understand all the financing options and how that works. That's been very good. And I would say the biggest benefit has been on the regulatory side. So I'm very active in the regulatory process. And I think, you know, having a legal background is really being able to brief. I mean, we're briefing science. That's basically what it boils down to. Right. And so that's been extremely helpful. But in retrospect, I would have, if I had it to do over, I would get a science degree. Flip it around, <laughs> maybe learn, learn would, the legal part on the job rather than the reverse. Yeah. I would flip it around. Yes. When, when, you're, when you're scouting new opportunities with university partners, how did it work in the, in the beginning? And then I, I'm interested in how it works now. Because <laughs> the, the, a lot has changed in the last 20 years. Were you, do, you, do you scan the literature and look for interesting things that pop up? Do you sort of know the tech transfer offices? How does that process of 
of finding the 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 what was the phrase that you used about the the biology provocative how, biology, provocative yeah. biology. How does that pro, yeah. how did it work in the start and how does it work now? So in the start, there was this initiative, you know, in the state to to try to keep you know companies formed, and I was very lucky that I had gone to Boston, had experience, and was rare, you know, in the Texas environment, and so I got direct help, like active help from the tech transfer function at UT Southwestern. By the way, it was a very sophisticated uh, function. It had actually been taken over by a really, you know, great scientist and MD, Dennis Stone. He was actually a nephrologist and had done a lot of work on the pumps and transporters in the proximal tubules, a lot of basic science, great guy. But he had this he was the flip of me. He had this great business acumen and was fascinated by it. And so the president of the university gave him, you know, he ran tech transfer, which is very unusual. Like he was not like a tech transfer professional. Yeah. And Dennis and I met and we got along and we, we spent a lot of time talking about this strategy about how do we do that? How do we build a company industry here? And we were, we also worked with the people at MD Anderson and they were very helpful as well. So they had curated many projects. And I spent all this time the first few years, you know, basically visiting labs, going through science in those institutions and their partners. And that's actually how we found the triterpenoids, our, our NRF2 activators, because they were at MD Anderson being jointly developed with Dr. Sporn. And how does it work now? Is it very similar to that? Now, yes, we have relationships with the tech transfer functions. And we also tend to focus on the really good institutions that are not on the East or West Coast because they're likely to be ignored. I mean, there's so much great science, you know, that's outside of those and they, it just doesn't get worked. And so, you know, again, we're kind of contrarian. We go other places to look, look for that. We had licensed this great asset from K KU, Kansas University. It's our, we're about to go into phase two this year. And these are molecules that they modulate the heat shock proteins, HSP90, but through the C-terminal binding, not N-terminal binding. And this has this, these remarkable effects. You get the pure cytoprotective effects of, of HSP activation. And the data in animal models of, of peripheral neuropathy is spectacular. We're really excited to see what happens in the clinic. And so those came out of that, like there was just amazing data and they kind of knew the target, but not exactly how it was translating over. And so the same thing, we, we brought it in. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about the HSP because when, yeah. when I was preparing for the episode, you, you, it seems like you've got two big pillars right now. You've got the NRF2 opportunity and then you've got the the HSP which is a couple of years a couple of years earlier in development what are the major targets for that program is it again a, a really broad set of targets you could go after it what you like. see what you see in in the animal data uh, we call it 901 what you see in the animal data are first of all like in in peripheral neuropathy like whether you whether you take a OBOB or a DBDB, or you knock out islets, you know, you, you give the rodent, you know, diabetes. And you may be familiar with these experiments. They, you do a Paul latency experiment. So you apply heat or a uh, little pin pressures of Von Frey apparatus, and you measure the time to basically for them to lift their, their paw for the first time. And we, in these experiments with 901, they develop full minute in, in sensate neuropathy. They never lift their paw. You give 901, and in 30 days, they're normal, one to two oh. second latency. Take it away, back to insensate. Give it back to one to two. And you, it's across those, those animal models in multiple labs, uh, multiple molecules. And then there are other models of neuropathy. You know, can, it works in chemically induced nerve crush. You know, so uh, it's really really exciting. I mean, uh, if that data translates over, it's going to be a really important class of drugs. And we're still working out, like we're working with Andre Abramoff at University College London, doing, was doing work with the, with the compounds with us and some other collaborators. And right now it's looking like there's some overlap in terms of modulating, you know, the redox status, you know, as part of its activity.
Just to to close up here, I feel like you have you've really gone through a lot with the NRF two program, and I, I I suspect it's been a study in resiliency and and grit and determination. Could you talk a little bit about about that and what it's you, you've had some major success along the way, but you've also had some really big setbacks. Yeah. Was there ever a point where you thought we'll 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 do something else? So how did you stay the course through? 20 years of working on this program. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've had a lot of setbacks, like particularly in the, the lead was our CKD program. And, uh, you know, we did a, you know, two year study in, in uh, Alport syndrome, a genetic, rare genetic CK, form of CKD, one of the, one of the most, most deadly. And we hit all the endpoints, but we got shot down at the adcom. It was really disappointing. You know, it's that therapeutic area is a really difficult one because you, you really don't have the patience to do a time to kidney failure study, which would be a true clinical endpoint. And so you're, you're measuring changes in GFR, which you know, are not considered clinical endpoints because patients don't feel them. And then you're trying to extrapolate, do there are these changes in GFR, are they going to actually reduce the risk dialysis, all this uncertainty? And I think that was a major problem you know, for our failure there. And I think it's you know, you go through these things, you have these big setbacks, they're devastating, but you need to have, in our case, we've always had multiple shots on goal. And I will say we're all driven by the belief that this is just really important pharmacology to, to mankind. I really think it's really important. And I'm actually having huge relief that we got it approved for something, right? That it, these yes. drugs will be around, they'll be available at some point, they'll be genetic, widely available or generic, widely available. And I, I feel really good about that. As so you should. just have to keep at its drug development. I mean, it's hard, you know? It, it is really hard. Well, I, I just want to say thank you. I think it's an incredible story. You've been you've dedicated the last 20 years of your life to something really important. And I appreciate you sharing all the all the amazing details with us and taking the time to do this. Oh, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your having me on. Great. And as always, thanks, everybody, for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, then we'd really appreciate it. If you first and foremost, share it with a friend. That's what matters to me most or colleague or or, or a loved one. And then we'd love if you could leave us a review as well. Thanks again. As always, you can reach us at podcast at sonogenetics.com and we'll see you next time. 